Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're glad you could join us today for our webinar, Make Useful Maps and Layers in ArcGIS. This webinar is an installation of the 2019 Spatial Data Webinar Series. I am your host, Carissa Schrader, with Esri's product marketing team, and I am joined here today with guests Rich and Keith. Both are product engineers that bring with them valuable experience in creating and servicing layers available in ArcGIS Online and Living Atlas. We're glad to have them with us today. There are many ways to create content using spatial data, but what is the best choice for your map? We'll begin today by asking a few poll questions and then introduce the Living Atlas. We will cover three layer types, feature layers, vector tile layers, and feature layer views, and how to combine them to make an interactive web map using ArcGIS Online. We will share a production workflow to automate feature service updates and cover how to create multiple variations of a service using feature layer views. Lastly, we'll demonstrate effective ways to work with colleagues using a collaboration group. Resources are available in the live webinar window please use the PDF provided to access links to the material discussed today. We will reserve time to answer questions at the end of the webinar. Please feel free to utilize uh, the chat option to ask your questions and we'll address the topics as timing permits. Now let's start off with a poll. Our first question is, what is your experience in using ArcGIS? Please select your response and I'll share the results with the group. It looks like we have 57% advanced and uh, about 20% novice, 18% expert. So it's great to have you all on board with us today. And also great to see that we have advanced users on the line. And we'll head on over now to Rich, who will introduce the Living Atlas to us. So hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to share with you how you can use hosted layers in ArcGIS.com to make a high-performance web map and how to reuse and repurpose your work to get maximum value from your work and simplify maintenance over the long haul. I'm going to share the workflow and a few tips for creating a hosted feature layer and a hosted vector tile layer and how we combine them to make a web map. Hosted layers mean that no server is needed. With just ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online, you too can make great web maps. So today I'm going to start by showing you our USA Flood Hazard Areas web map and then do a brief overview of services, layers, and web maps. And then I'll show you how easy it is to publish a high quality feature layer or vector tile layer from ArcGIS Pro. And then finally, I'll wrap things up by showing you how to use feature layer views in the vector tile style editor to get the most out of your work. Keith is going to follow up with some more advanced topic that will really, topics that will really help you excel. So now Rich is going to start a demo to share a little bit about the Living Atlas with all of you. Here we have the Living Atlas web page. It's just simply livingatlas.arcgis.com. Um, the Living Atlas of the world is a global collection of geographic information. This, the Living Atlas is curated by Esri with contributions from partners and the user community. The Living Atlas contains valuable maps, layers, tools, and apps for geographic analysis is available throughout the ArcGIS platform, including ArcGIS Desktop, Online, and Enterprise. So Keith and I both work for the Environment team, and produce the layers contained in this section of the Living Atlas, or the resources, I should say. There's quite a few things in here. Um, each of these, objects we're seeing represents a resource in the Living Atlas, so a layer, a web map, an application, or several other things. In this view, each Living Atlas item has a thumbnail, a small icon indicating what it is, and some text that summarizes what the item is. Um, um, so let's start by searching for the USA flood hazard areas. We can go up here. Search for flood hazard areas. 
We're specifically looking for a web map here, so I'm going to go ahead and filter my search return, and we get the USA Flood Hazards web map. I'll open that up. So this takes us to what we call the content item or kind of the, the resources web page in ArcGIS.com and Little Living Atlas. We can open the map and see that we have six classes kind of indicating the level of flood hazard for a given area. Uh, this map was created by the, from the United States Federal Emergency Management Agency's Flood Insurance Rate Map. This map is particularly popular and gets a lot of use, which is not surprising since it is used to determine if flood insurance is required for federally backed home mortgages. I'm gonna to switch to the gray canvas uh, base map just to give us a little different view of this data. And so we can scroll out and get some idea of the extent of the data set. Tends to be a little patchy, but we have the entire continental United States. We also have uh, Hawaii and parts of Alaska and the US territories, including Guam, uh, Puerto Rico, and uh, the Northern Marius, Marianas Islands, and a few other places around the world. So pretty extensive. I'm going to go to Corvallis, Oregon now, just back to the mainland. Um, and back to our imagery base map. So you kind of see how easy it is to work with this map and zoom around and see these different data. I'll go up here to Crabtree, Oregon, which has some really interesting stuff. So this data is updated about every six months, and uh, it's a pretty extensive data set. It's fairly large and complicated with more than 2.5 million features, and it takes up somewhere about 13 and a half gigabytes when it's sitting on a disk. Uh, hydrologic features tend to be pretty challenging to work with all in all, uh, just the curvy kind of continuous nature of them. We'll see if I can get, for example, this one polygon in the data set, it's not only quite detailed, but it's pretty long as well. So these things just become a, a big payload for the internet to, to move through. So we do a few things that I'll show you in a minute to make this work a little better. Um, so we really like that this map draws well across all scales. You can see as I zoom in, at, in and out, it's pretty fast. The features draw nicely. Uh, some other things that I like about this map, we can look at the table here with the data, and we can see that I've added field aliases to the names. So rather than using, you know, the, the kind of hard to read for a human coded field names, we have a lot nicer field names. So when a user finds your data and begins to explore it, they can right away understand what's going on. Having the field aliases really helps when you go to, to uh, configure pop-ups as well. So, we'll show you. We also have a really nicely configured pop up in this map. It's not really very large, but it's clear to a user what the map's about. And it really helps because this is where a user asks questions of your map and how you can communicate about the map back to the user. So, taking the time to have a well configured pop up is uh, pretty important. So, if we go over to here. So now I'm basically just going to take you through a quick run through of services, layers, and web maps. Some of you are likely familiar with services and the service REST endpoint I'm showing right now. If you're not, that's okay. I just want to make sure that this gets connected for the folks that do. A server is simply a computer that receives requests and sends data back. In our case, the server returns maps. An important thing to note is that each service has its own specific name in the form of a URL. In this case, the service's name is landscape11.arcgis.com all the way through flood hazard areas. And we can see by the, the end of the name there that it's an image server. So this is an image service. You could just work straight from the server from this web page and view the map. like this, and I'll need to sign in for this one because it's a subscription required.
and now it'll bring us out to the map viewer and we can see this layer is actually just coming straight off the server no living atlas or kind of online item involved but the 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 rest endpoint isn't the greatest user experience for people that you're going to be trying to target so you could use the services name uh and the URL, I'm sorry, you could use the URL, the services name to create an item in ArcGIS.com. So we are talking about, since we are talking about hosted layers today, we don't need to worry too much about how all this server stuff works, but I wanted to make that connection. So with hosted layers, ArcGIS.com takes care of server things behind the scenes for us so we can focus on our work. Um, when you reference a service in ArcGIS, online, either hosted or from a server that you manage yourself, you create a layer. So we're going to close this, and we'll go back over here. So what we can do is we have a web map here that has a couple of layers in it, and we can click the More Options view here and go out to Show Item Details, which takes us to the content item for this feature layer that we published. Layers reference services and provide a kind of home base in ArcGIS online that we call a content item or often just an item. Layers come in several varieties. Today we are focusing on feature layers and vector tile layers. We can see that this item is for a feature service from the icon that here that looks like a little pointer on the map and the words feature service or feature layer right next to it. Layers have their own special properties. They refer to a service URL as we manage it. Man mention and we can scroll down here and see this service url straight from the item shows a connection to a server layers can save information about how to display the service such as a, a custom symbology scale range transparency pop-up configuration and more so if we go back Show details about, and then more details takes us back to the web maps content item here. Web maps, like layers, have a content item, as we have seen, that, and contain a base map plus one or more reference or operational layers. Web maps bring it all together and can embed, be embedded in a web page used to build your applications or shared as a standalone map. Web maps have many of the same properties as layers, but include other additional ones, such as base map and layer drawing order. Additionally, layers may be created and saved in the web map without creating an additional content item. If we go to the active map, we can see there are two ways to share. There's a share window that appears here if you're logged in, and then you can also go to the content. This is the important one. And uh, if you're logged in, you'll see a uh, save layer down here. So feature layers are powerful and provide access to uh, the full geometry and attributes. So they function much like uh, you would use a file geodatabase and a feature class sitting on your disk, except these things are coming across the internet. So to show you some of these uh, powerful functions and feature classes, I'm going to skip over here to ArcGIS Pro. And I'm going to go up here to our map tab and add data. If I select this choice right here, we get the Living Atlas. And I'm going to search the Living Atlas for USA flood hazard areas. And we can see here, this is a feature layer, both by the type says it, and then it has a little feature layer icon. I'm gonna add that to our map, and then zoom in here again. And this draws. So just to, to demonstrate that this works like a feature class, we can select these features. So I'll select a few of them. You can see that there. We open the table. And we can see that I've selected 16 of the features. You can almost not tell this is coming from a feature class or feature layer at this point. 
we can go out and I could do something as simple as use this as a geoprocessing input. So we could say copy features. And then use that just simply as an input and run this. And in just a few seconds, we've now kind of downloaded these and uh, and have these features here on our local drive. Some big features that we selected. So there they are. So that shows. Likewise, we can use this in a Python script or in a model. In a model, you would just simply drag this layer into the model. We could go back here and drag copy features into there and then just connect this and use it as input features. I could just click run now and it would do the same thing. Uh, likewise with Python scripts, you can just pop it right in there and it works. Um, so how do we publish one of these things? Well, prior to publishing this feature layer, I did a little cleanup to help the layer perform better make our output put look nicer and honestly to make my life easier in the long run to avoid problems in the future with analysis pop-ups and legend i converted minus 9999 values to no data in a couple of numeric fields and changed the flood zone text field from all capitals to title capitals to lighten the load i created an empty new schema with field aliases and then used minimized field links appropriate field types and appended the features to it this allowed me to make the, the attribute table as small as possible while containing all the information. Uh, one thing to that in Pro that I really like to use is the fields view. If you haven't seen this yet, it's something to know about. You just come in here in the fields view, and this gives you a full list of the fields in your table. It shows their, their format, their length for text fields, it's a good place to start looking for values that you can reduce. For example, a lot of times I'll see fields that are 255 characters long. If you're only putting values that are up to 10 characters long in that field, that's a lot of information you're sending kind of as an empty thing. So we also went through and cleaned up some of the features. So to reduce the number of features overall that we have to transmit through the internet, we uh, reduced the, or we eliminated the classes undetermined flood hazard or area minimal flood hazard. And by taking those out, we remove about 400,000 features. And so we cut our initial 2.5 million features down to about 2.1 million. Uh, the no data polygons don't bring a lot of value to the user. And we do have them in an image service if someone really needs them in an analysis. So after we clean up the table, clean up the geometry, I generally run a check geometry and try and fix any geometry errors. Then we go ahead and we start, then we're ready to publish this. So you come up to share. First, we want to clear the selection because we don't want to publish a subset. We go to share, web layer, and then publish as a web layer. And this should open up the little tab with a tool over here as it comes up. And so there's just a couple settings we're going to have to hit here and uh, as this tool comes up. So we would go ahead, we'd give this a, a name. We'd also turn off and remove the world topographic map and hill shade, add a summary and tags, and then just hit publish on this. This probably would take, depending on your uh, internet connection, somewhere around 45 minutes, half an hour to publish. Works pretty good. And uh, this will create an item on ArcGIS.com, upload your data, and publish it as a hosted feature service. This is a really nice kind of feature that you can do this. It's up there. It works good. And you can use these tools for analysis. So why not just publish a feature layer and kind of call it good and move on? Well, the problem we run into, especially with these kind of feature dense, complicated things, is it takes uh, a lot of work to draw them at larger or smaller and smaller scales as you zoom out. And you can see our performance tends to fall off here. And then we have a scale limit set on it as well. 
Um, so this is where the vector tiles come in. So um, vector tiles are kind of a, a new technology that allows us, much like you might have seen raster tiles of the past, to send out big maps over the web and draw things pretty quickly. Um, let's see. So yeah, vector tiles are functionally similar to the cache raster tiles you may have seen or worked with before. And uh, to publish vector tiles is a pretty straightforward setup with geoprocessing. We go in and we use this tool to vector. So we create a vector tile package using this tool. It's pretty simple. We input a map. We uh, set the cache scale. Note that the uh, the default scale is 1 to 564. We don't want to cache this map all the way down to that scale. It would take about four hours to build the vector tile package. So I cut it off at 250,000 for the vector tiles that we use in our our uh, flood hazard area web map. We hit run. This takes about an hour to run, a little less than an hour to run. And then we run a second tool, the share package tool. I actually have it here in my recents. And this is a pretty simple, so the package we just made with the last tool goes into this, you hit run. And this just takes a couple of minutes to copy the vector tile package to the web and it creates an item in ArcGIS.com. Then if this is one that I just ran last night here. And so you can see that the content item needs some work. It needs a thumbnail, it needs a summary, it needs a better title. But it's put this vector tile package up here. And then if we hadn't published it yet, it would, it would have a uh, publish button right over here between share and update, I believe. So we would hit that, it would publish the tiles and create a second item that's now a tile layer. Same thing, it needs some work here. But you can see, oh, that, that publication step takes about 30 or 40 seconds to run. And here we have a brand new set of vector tiles. Um, so you can, you can see these drawing here at a variety of scales. They should cut off at about 200. Yeah, there it is. So they cut off at about 288,000. But you can see these are handy for drawing those smaller scales in our map. So just a couple quick things here and I'll wrap up. So there's two ways to kind of stretch out your work with these and, and get a little more bang for your buck. Now that you've published a feature layer, you've published the vector tile layer, you might want to do a little more with that. And so here I am back in the feature layer item. I'm now logged in as a user, as the owner actually, and I can create a view layer. By doing this, we'll just put demo here. This creates a new copy of, of the item and it points back to the same data set. Now, the nice thing about this is that when you update your original feature layer, this new layer view will also be updated because it just points back at that. So here we have this, it's a feature layer. And now we've made a copy of it. And so say we want to display it in some other way. This is a new layer, so it doesn't know where to zoom into yet. But we zoom in here, we can see it drawing. And so you could use a filter here and kind of limit what you're seeing. But then the user could just turn that filter off down the road. So one unique thing layer views have here is that they have this set view to definition. And so you could do things like go in and turn off some fields. So say uh, if you were working with rare species locations, you might want to turn off the specifics, latitude and longitude, or some sort of site description that would let people know exactly where those organisms are. We could do that, or we could, we could also do this by uh, value. So we can do an area of interest as well, or we can do features. So here we could take this, and we could say Esri Symbology, apply definition, and now we just have a layer view that only shows us this 1% class, the actual areas that need flood insurance. So this is great. We have the second item now. We can make a second web map. So we get some bang for our buck. We have two maps to show from one data set we published. But unfortunately now our vector tiles don't match the new layer we've made. 
But vector tiles have a similar thing that we can do just to get around this problem. So this is the vector tile style editor, and we put the link in it to, in the resources page. We can click to get started. We come in here. I'm logged in so we can see my styles. We can open up a flood hazard tiles, and we can go in and we can actually make changes to this. It's going to draw a little slow here for me. Oh, there we go. So we can go in and we can turn some of these layers off. And then what we'll do is we'll save this as its own new new set of tiles. And so now this is saved out, and this is creating an item in ArcGIS.com. So we should be able to go back in here to my content and see our newest item should be that tile layer we just made or a new tile style. And if we go in here, we can see that if I've done this correctly, we should be drawing only the purple. And there it is. So now you could put this new feature layer view together with this new uh, vector tile style and make a second web map. So you can hopefully through those demos see how these things go together and how some of these resources be, can be used to make multiple maps out of one data set and really carry things forward. So now Keith is going to show us in a few minutes some more advanced topics of how to really push this stuff to the edge. We're going to go right over to Keith now, so just bear with us as we switch over the screen. Oh. And thank you, Rich, for sharing that information with us as as we um as we we're going. That was it was really interesting to see all the different ways to make the vector tiles, and and Keith's going to expand on that further now. Thanks, Rich, for the great information on the, about the flood hazard areas. I definitely appreciate the way you used a hosted feature view to control the fields that a user might have access to. Um, it seems like a really good utility uh, to really uh, combat redundant data out there, uh, linking back to that original hosted feature service. Uh, so today I'm going to be covering, uh, I'm going to be discussing hosted feature views as well and how to create one from a hosted feature layer. Uh, I'll go over a collaboration group in ArcGIS Online and uh, how a hosted feature view can undergo a curation process, uh, leveraging the, the creative talents of your organization uh, in that uh, collaboration group. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, this dashboard that's up on the screen and the hosted feature view that powers this coral bleaching dashboard, um, how the data was obtained and used to create a layer, and how that layer is used within a collaboration group uh, to create a product. Um, and then lastly, uh, we'll share a Python script that we use to keep hosted feature services synced with the source data. Uh, so I think that's, you know, one of the things that's really important is this data is getting updated. It's in this dashboard and it's being presented. Um, how do we keep that updated in a routine basis? Uh, so for the, the hosted feature layer, uh, NOAA is a great provider of, uh, of authoritative data. They have all sorts of publicly available information that can be transformed into layers and maps. Uh, today we'll be accessing data from the NOAA Coral Reef Watch program and uh, go ahead and take a look at their their website real quick. And, uh, and we'll use their their information to create that that dashboard. Along with the information about the various projects and supporting metadata that can be found on the NOAA Coral Reef Watch program, they provide access to a web-based JSON file that's updated regularly. 
The data is for virtual coral reef stations and describe the current health of coral based upon different parameters. So we'll take a look at that JSON file. And we can see uh, just by taking a cursory look at it that it's composed of, we've got a feature here and the type is point. And we also have a feature here and the type is a multi-polygon. And it's made up of all these different coordinates. So, so this is a large JSON file that really um, you know, has a lot of spatial information on it that's getting updated regularly. So what we're going to do here uh, is we're going to go ahead and, and take this, this local file and we'll save it down uh, locally. So we'll save this into our, our, project, our, our local storage, save that file, and uh, now we have a, a local copy of that file that we can use. With that information, um, we can we can go to our, our ArcGIS Online uh, account, and within here, uh, maybe we're going to create a new folder to help uh, keep our data organized. So for the purposes of this, I'll keep it simple. And uh, we've got our webinar coral already existing, and there are no items in there yet. So here we are in that location, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, this item uh, from our computer to uh, create this, this uh, hosted feature layer. So here's the, the Polygon JSON file that we just had a look at online and downloaded. And here we can define our title and also uh, add in any tags uh, that we might be interested in, in including here. And we can add an item, and, and here's where you want to make sure that we publish um, as a feature layer is checked. Um, so here is, is important. This is checked by default, but this is what's going to generate that hosted feature layer for you uh, uh, from this. So it's going through updating that item, uh, checking the status, and then it tells us here that it's publishing the service. Uh, so this brings us to the content item page uh, for that hosted feature layer uh, that we just generated. So we've walked through uh, these steps in creating that, that hosted feature layer. And uh, you know we have this published and it's and we have access to the content item and we can take a look at the data in the in the map viewer at this point in time. And we see that you know everything has translated the way that we would expect it to. It's come across, we see the points uh, that we had a look at, and we see the the polygon areas that we had a look at. Uh, they've, they've come across successfully. Um, now is when you would really think about stylizing the layer and maybe uh, configuring pop-ups and doing, um, doing some other things like that, but we also know the nature of the data is dynamic, right? It's going to be updated frequently. So that work that we would do would be short-lived uh, pretty much until the next time that that data set was updated. Uh, so this is really where uh, the hosted layer view comes in really handy. Uh, you, have, um, you have a lot of options to uh, really control the, the underlying data and, and put this veneer uh, using this hosted feature, uh, hosted layer view on top. So hosted feature view, uh, what is a hosted fe feature view and what are they? Um, so you can, uh, with a hosted feature view, you can apply uh, different editor settings, styles or filters, um, define which features or fields are available, like Rich uh, talked about earlier, 
and uh, share different views uh, with groups or members that need access to that data. Um, only the owner of a hosted feature layer can create a hosted feature layer view from the original layer. And um, it's different than copying a layer uh, and, and saving it uh, within, your, within your profile in ArcGIS Online. This is, uh, you're creating a, a view that's gonna uh, persist and is linked to that hosted feature layer itself. Uh, so we'll walk through uh, the step of, of creating that uh, hosted feature view from uh, the content item uh, that we just created from that hosted uh, uh, feature layer. So here uh, we're back to our content item that we've generated. Uh, we see uh, some options over here that might be new to some of you. Uh, the hosted uh, create view layer is what creates that uh, hosted feature view for us. So we're gonna, um, let's go ahead and take a couple lo uh, look at some of the other things in here as well. Uh, so I'm the owner of this, it's in the folder, and then right now uh, the sharing on this, it's, it's not shared with, with anybody, right? So it's, it's just mine uh, and, and no one else can see it. I could create a view layer from this, and this is where uh, we're going to have uh, maybe some, some better naming uh, applied to our title, something meaningful that's gonna persist and live with this, this hosted feature view. The tags that we created with the hosted feature layer uh, come across, and then we also have the options of, of, of adding a summary in there, uh, which I plan to do later. Oh, sorry. And what we'll do is create this view layer. It's good to notice the, the title um, and, and to keep it consistent, maybe in an organization where adding V2 helped to separate um, what, what was originally there, especially if we think about collaboration. <clears throat> So here, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the layer names. Uh, so here I have access to edit the different layer names. I know that the first one here, where it says uh, virtual station polygons is actual, actually the, uh, the stations. It was the first thing that was read in that JSON file, right? It was the points that we were looking at. And then uh, the next thing was the, was the areas. Uh, and this is what we're gonna change to areas here. Uh, so this is nice to have this utility right here within the view uh, to, to change that. So that's gonna change the way that that is displayed uh, within my map view. Uh, we can also go to our visualization tab, and this is where we have the opportunity to uh, configure some of the, the attributes, right? So this data is getting updated we're not transforming any of the field names, but we do have control over the field aliases, right? And we can configure the field aliases through configure attributes. So nothing bugs me more than field names that don't make sense. And it, we, everybody sees a field alias and there's a location that you can go to and update that. And that's what I'm gonna show you right here. So SST, um, it might not, it doesn't mean something to everybody, and what it does stand for is sea surface temperature. So we have the ability to define that within, this, uh, within the field alias, and we can go through and define other fields as well. So why not make useful, meaningful names that will then translate through to our pop-up as well? So this information will be stored within this view, and even though that underlying data is constantly being updated, this will persist and we won't have to go back and change it again. So I've applied those simple changes uh, through the configure attributes and now we can see uh, that the hotspot, degree heating weeks, sea surface temperature anomaly and sea surface temperature field name values are, are coming across with the appropriate alias. Um, we also have the opportunity to style 
here so we can change the different um, uh, styling or symbology associated with the layer. And then once we get something we're happy with, we're able to, to save that. Here, we, because we have two different layers within the, the hosted feature view, we can access each one of those individually and style them independently. And what we're doing here is gonna get saved to that layer as well. Uh, backing back out to the content level, some of us, our job ends uh, at the uh, at the level where we've, we've created that content item, we have other people maybe in our organization that are better at working with content items, pop-ups, attributes, and so on. Um, so this is where I think uh, a collaborative group is really uh, something that can be uh, leveraged within an organization to use those unique capabilities. Uh, so a collaboration group, uh, is some place where you can do technical review and adjustment before it's made public. So you can modify layer names, you can edit the content item, you can style the layer like we just did, you can configure the pop-ups, you can apply arcade expressions, and, and, and you can edit the max amount of features through the admin console even. Uh, so this is, there's a lot of opportunities for, for, for different roles within your group. Uh, so maybe that data scientist was that person that published that layer in the beginning and they've created this hosted feature view because they're the owner and now they're, you know, they're going to focus on that next data set and how to bring that to life. So they, their role has kind of ended and the next role of your web editor, uh, that, that person that's really good at HTML editing or really good, um, with creating meaningful arcade expressions, uh, they can jump in and they can do some twick, uh, quick tweaks and apply that to your layer and really um, uh, transform some of the, the, the fields and maybe uh, have nice uh, photos associated with your content that really content item that describe the features therein. And then a cartographer, right? So cartography, there's a lot of options on how to display um, uh, different features and uh, we need you know someone that, that creates a meaningful um, uh, symbology and style uh, for the the information product uh, that we're designing so this is where a cartographer can step in and control the styles associated with your layer and maybe they're going to do scale dependencies and control things at different um, different resolutions so this is an opportunity for them to to, to use that collaboration group to do that. Uh, so I'll show you um, quickly how to use that technology. And we, what we do is, is we go to that, that folder that we've, we've got the data stored in. Interesting. And, uh, we have a group that we've set up, and this is a group that is only uh, that the members may update items. So when you create a group, you have an option to apply a setting where groups uh, have ability to, or persons within that group have the ability to update the items. And uh, this group in particular that we've been working with today uh, for the coral we have the option of going into that Coral Reef stations. And if we click share here, we can click this button that says access and update capabilities. This is what sets a collaboration group apart from a regular group in ArcGIS Online. And then we can look at that uh, Living Atlas of the World Environment Oceans group that we've created, and I can share this item with that group. And everyone in there has access to update that item and update those, those features uh, with their supporting roles, whether you're the web editor, whether you're the cartographer, or whether you're the data scientist. So I think that's really powerful from a production mapping standpoint of being able to share that responsibility. Or maybe someone's out of the office for a week. You've got this group where that, that data lives and you have the ability to 
really collaborate as a group uh, there within. <clears throat> so uh, lastly, uh, what I want to touch on is, is this, uh, this script. Uh, so we have a, uh, a, a Python 3 script that's out there. It's standalone. So once you've created this hosted feature uh, layer in ArcGIS Online, this script will go out. It'll grab. Uh, you, <clears throat> it'll you provide the URL where the data lives. You provide your profile information for your ArcGIS Online account, the item ID and the item name, and it will uh, continually update that um, as long as you run that script. So it's a Python script that's when it's ran, it'll update that feature service. And uh, this is the line of code that it takes to run it for me on my machine to keep that updated. Uh, it would be very similar uh, for you. And uh, what you can do is you can plug this into your task uh, ma uh, manager task scheduler, and you can have it run at a regular interval at that point in time. So you could call Python from your task scheduler to update this coral uh, layer at a uh, interval uh, set by that task schedule, which might be a one day interval. Um, so that's really handy. Um, and this is the, it, it runs in Python 3, so anyone that's uh, using ArcGIS Pro, Pro ships with Python 3, and you can leverage that and run this in the background without launching even, you know, ArcGIS. So here is a link to where you can obtain that script. Uh, there's also an example to the Coral hosted feature view and the dashboard that we showed earlier. And then there's a uh, best practices for publishing online services uh, presentation that we're given in San Diego for our users conference uh, that we can uh, connect at there if you wanna know more. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Kay, Keith, and, and thank you, Rich. It's really great to hear your fresh perspective on how to work more collaboratively in ArcGIS. It's helpful to know the different roles within an organization that can work together to solve problems using GIS. And being able to think ahead and prepare data and layers that can be shared among departments is really important in today's workplace. Um, we do have a few questions that were sent over to us that we do have some time that we can get your help in answering. Um, can uh, let's see. I, I know you're both Living Atlas curators. I think this uh, first question would be really good for you. Um, what do you look for when curating um, in a quality data layer? Um, so, good question. I think I touched on this briefly uh, a minute ago. Was uh, just not the default settings, right? So don't just accept the default settings and move on. Uh, we're looking for good symbology, good meaningful pop-ups, uh, nice field names, and uh, the, the content item is really where you can communicate what your product is with your users that might be interested in it. So that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, I mean, along those same lines, what we're looking for is something that's a little more polished and finished and kind of authoritative than just a, a pile of data that's been tossed up on the web. I, and I really like pop-ups is a big thing that I'm interested in. The field aliases and a good content item are all important. I mean, well, we'll move on to the next question because I, I know that many of our listeners perhaps might not be familiar with Python at this point, and perhaps many of you are, and that's wonderful. But do you have any recommendations for how to, they could get started using Python in ArcGIS? Yeah, I certainly do. Um, Esri offers a free Python for everyone class. It's a three and a half hour class. I think that'd be a great place to uh, get started. There's plenty of uh, free or fairly inexpensive resources for learning Python out on the web. And then a book that I found really useful when I was starting out with Python was Python Scripting for ArcGIS, and you can get that through Esri Press. Perfect. Thank you, Rich and Keith, for taking the time to clarify these questions and for joining me today. If any additional questions arise, please feel free to reach out directly to Rich, Keith, or myself at the contacts provided. Or for anyone who would like to watch the session again, a follow-up email will be sent containing a recording of the webinar. 
Additionally, Living Atlas has great resources for you to stay involved. So you can visit livingatlas at arcgs.com regularly for live feeds, up-to-date data, and maps, apps, story maps to get you started in the platform. For those of you sharing your maps on Twitter, be sure to follow and take us at Living Atlas. The ArcGIS Living Atlas blog is updated often daily with blogs centralized around Esri's extensive content offering, launch updates, what's new, and how to articles. And we also have a monthly newsletter, the Living Atlas Gems, to keep you up to date with the latest data available in the Living Atlas, new apps, featured use cases, blogs, and learn lessons. Esri is currently hosting a free six-week course on cartography. This MOOC is taught by an experienced team of Esri cartographers using world-class GIS. And there's still time to sign up. So we encourage you to explore all of the learning options that Esri has to offer including our next webinar, which is Explore Ready-to-Use Demographic Data for Location Intelligence, and that is on June 12th. Um, you'll join Esri's Chief Demographer, Kyle Castle, and Esri's Demographics Product Manager, Lucy Guerra, and myself, as we share how to recognize patterns and trends with the latest demographic data available on the market. We also hope to see you, as, as Keith alluded to, in July at Esri User Conference in San Diego. This is your opportunity to connect with our community, learn from our experts, and get inspired by the latest software and innovation in technology. Be sure to check out the extensive list of activities and stop in to say hello at the Data and Location Services Island. Thank you again, Rich and Keith, for taking the time today to help our community. And to all of our listeners, we're thankful for your time, and we wish you the best as you start making useful maps and layers in ArcGIS. We will see you again next time, and until then, Happy mapping.